Do the, ch do the children have that? Do the oh, children? yes, yes. Yes, children's church, uh, you may leave now. Here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be here, amen? It's a beautiful time of year. It's just great. Man, y'all even look good today. I'm telling you, you got your Christmas colors on. I, had, I bought this green shirt this week. I couldn't wait to wear it today for the festive season. And I told Mindy, I said, I want to get me some red slacks to go with it. And she said, over my dead body. So as you can see, I'm conservative and khaki today. But uh, anyway, you guys look awesome, and, and uh, Open Door, we thank you all for being here. Give them another round of applause. It takes a lot of courage to get up and sing in front of a people that you don't have any idea who they are, and I want to thank you all for behaving and being so nice to them. But guys, we, we're so grateful, and and I thank God for you. I thank God for the way that you lift up your voices to bring praise to the greatest event that mankind has ever known. You know, in an obscure place like Nazareth, that'd be like being from Alney, right? Or Newcastle. It's a little bit off the beaten path, you know. Not too many people go through Nazareth. In an obscure place among... An obscure people, an obscure young girl receives an incredible message from a named known angel that has shown up before in the testimony that we read about in Scripture, Gabriel. When any time an angel is named, like there's Michael who's the archangel and we read about him in the book of Jude, but Gabriel, the, the angels rarely get a lot of press time when it comes to their specific name. You know that this is a significant event in the life of God and, and God's people in God's world. You know, singing like what we've done today is just an incredible gift of grace that God has given to the church. It's a way for us to highlight, to magnify to make large, to enlarge something that we do not want the world to miss. The incredible act of grace that God has blessed us with, with the coming of His Son, Jesus Christ. And you know what? All of creation is praising God. We just get to participate along with Him. Uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 96, verses 11 and through 13, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. And then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord. God has created vibration that tickles and dances upon our eardrums. And it's all around. Everything in creation gives voice and glory to the Creator. Uh, this past week, uh, Minnie and I, we live just a little bit off the square, and there's this large sycamore tree in the, I would say the backyard, but I guess it's really the back alley. And, uh, and the wind was blowing through it, and the leaves had died, but they had not let go yet. And you could hear the sound of the wind blowing through the sycamore trees, reminding us of a season that God has given. Uh, today, when, um, when Greg was teaching Bible class, Greg, I was listening to you, but I was looking out the back, and I saw the hills in the background, and I saw trees that had very little leaves on them. And I thought, you know, this is a time for being dormant. And, and that God has put into the seasons and the rhythm of creation this, this place of dormance, dormancy so that there can be renewal. I mean, God is just everywhere among us. And then today, you and I get to participate in singing about one of the glorious, uh, glorious, um, greatest moments 
we have ever known. Last night I had an interesting conversation among my family. Um, <laughs> we had sat down to eat supper and I told Mindy, I said, I'd like to hear some really nice Christmas music while we eat. So she put something on and I forgot what the song was, but it was just killing me. I'm like, can we do something else? And I was like, you know, and, and then we got into a discussion about what's your favorite Christmas song? And, you know, and Mindy and Eli and Rebecca, I think their favorite Christmas song is for King and Country, The Little Drummer Boy. I have, what's it called? What's yours, Eli? Okay, let's just go ahead and get it in right now. Go ahead. All I want for Christmas is you. Is there a particular girl you're talking about here? Just one. All right, and Rebecca, what was it? Little Drummer Boy by For King and Country, you know, and it's, you know, it's just, have any of you ever heard that? It's just awesome. The huge drums that they're beating, announcing, you know, this, this glorious arrival of Christ. My favorite is sung by Josh Groban. I think I pronounced his name correctly. Groban, is that close enough? Right, Oh Holy Night. How many of you ever heard, I know you've heard the song Oh Holy Night. We sang it today, I believe. But have you ever heard Josh Groban sing A Holy Night? You know, I would almost attempt it. Oh, holy night. I'll stop right there. The stars are brightly shining. You know, and I'm like getting into it, and I'm like singing it. Man, when he gets near the end of it, Noel, Noel. I'm like, I get this little, I get this thing up in my throat. Oh, it's okay. It's all right. I'll stop right there. It really is okay. So I, I get this little lump in my throat. And I'm like, Mindy, aren't you moved by that? And she looked at me and goes, no. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Everybody in my family is messed up. Or maybe it's just me. But all oh, to be moved, to be moved in these, this, this moment when it's put to song, I mean, it's, it is moving us, and it should always move us. We pick up the story in Luke today, and I want to spend a few moments just reflecting from this passage in the, in the time that we have. Luke chapter 1, verses 28, 26 and following. This glorious announcement. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's Zachariah's wife. This is the mother of John the Baptist. She's pregnant with John. In her sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, or all near Newcastle, whatever, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. and You are to call him Jesus. And he will be great and we be, will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How? How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Well, Gabriel, I don't know if this is possible because I've already made selections down at uh, the store there on the square, and, and, and my friends are, are, are getting ready to provide for me a, a really big shower and we've had all these plans and, and um, I, I, who's going to believe that, that I'm going to be with child as a virgin? <laughs> this is remarkable, isn't it, for us to understand? Can you imagine God interrupting your wedding plans? You know, 
I mean, yeah, most of, most of you ladies, young girls, you know, you have in your mind what your wedding should be. You, you, you play that as a little child. You wear the little Cinderella dresses, and you can conceive of this in your mind, what it's going to be like. And, and then you go to other people's weddings, and you've seen it happen. And then as you get older and you start dating someone, and then you find that whoever that Mr. or Mrs. Perfect is, and then you've got, you start planning all of these things so that they can have this perfect event, and then boom, something interrupts it. And it changes everything. It changes the complete trajectory of your life. God interrupts. And Mary says... I'm the Lord's servant. That's a fascinating text. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be or may it be as you have said. And I would say that every single one of us are here today because Mary said, let it be. Think about that. You know, this was certainly a scandalous predicament that a young girl likely between the ages of 13 and 16 is going to be dealing with. You know, when you're young, sometimes you're naive, and naivete is a blessing. <laughs> Have y'all heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? Like, I don't really want to know everything, right? And those of us that have lived a lot longer in life, wouldn't you like to have the joy of naive, naivety again? You know, the, it's like we're just young and dumb. We're just making it up as we go, and you don't think about all the consequences, but it's the parents and the grandparents that go, oh, my goodness. Well, have you thought about this? 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 And the next thing you know is, I don't want to be around people like that anymore. I like being young and dumb. I don't know if Mary is young and naive in the sense that she's just immediately willing to be God's servant. Or she understands the depth and the magnitude of, of the promises of God. This is certainly an exceptional, never-before-experienced greeting a human has ever known. She knows what a normal greeting is like, and this is no normal greeting. And God, through the angel Gabriel, gives her information about what it is, that God is a God who keeps his promises. God is faithful. God doesn't forget. And at the right moment, God is going to do his thing. And to be willing, open, and available to God. For Mary's sense, she is favored. In her 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old status, she's favored. Can you imagine a 13 or 14 year old conceiving a child? I would say, not my girls. Somebody's going to die. Are y'all following me? Right? It's so funny. In, in uh, Mindy's ma uh, family, she has an aunt that lives up in Colorado now. Uh, they lived there a number of years. She and her husband uh, planted the church in Buena Vista, Colorado many years ago and she grew up in Abilene was born and raised in Abilene at the age of 13 I kid you not at the age of 13 she was married to a guy who was uh, uh, in the Air Force at Dias Air Force Base can you imagine a young man at Dias or a young military guy that's going to marry your daughter that's 13 years of age <laughs> I had asked Mindy two or three times I'm like are you serious it was 13 she was married at 13 her mom and dad who are both had, grew up and were faithful members of the Lord's church gave their consent for her to be married at 13 years of age and she wasn't even pregnant right you would expect maybe in the 50s well you know, if somebody's going to get married in their early teens, there's something's happened here, right? And she, actually, she didn't have a child till she was two years later, 15 years of age. It's, oh, yeah, and they were married for over 40 years and had three children. It's just an amazing couple for the Lord. 
and an incredible servant in God's church. He preached, went to school, a uh, school of preaching, and then preached all of his adult life. So who knows how God can use any of us? Maybe being young and naive is not it, but what if we were young at heart and available? Mary makes herself available, and she is favored by God. And I guess this morning, I want us to think about, you know, God, God is not, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for here? God doesn't show favoritism. Like, he wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, his favor is upon all people, for God so loved the whole world, right? But does God, does God have favorites? He blesses everyone, but God works powerfully in those that he favors. Uh, the scriptures tell us in Isaiah uh, chapter 66, the second part of verse 2, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. What, is, what does the scripture say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. One of the things that we discover is that God has, he, he does have favorites. And he pours out his favor upon his favorites. Remember the very first time in Scripture in which the word favor is even mentioned? There was the offering of Cain, and there was the offering of Abel. And the Bible tells us that, the, that God looked upon Abel's offering with favor. In other words, what we discover in life is that favor comes to favorites. Like, for instance, several Christmases ago when my oldest daughter, Hannah, was, was really young and getting into school and had started asking for a computer, we had Christmas at her home and, and uh, she opened up a present, as did everyone else, and there was no computer. And so Granddad said, hey, why don't we go to Walmart and let's just see what they have? And so he takes her to Walmart, and they go look around, and none of us know what they're up to. But Hannah comes back with a brand-new laptop computer. Can I say someone got played the favorite? Of course, Hannah, she could look at Granddad and go, Granddad, I love you. Granddad would melt like butter. Anybody else in here like that? You know, and Re Rebecca was at a tennis tournament uh, one time in, um, in Mason, and she was playing, and there was a company, a tennis company out of Lubbock that had everything for sale. I think it was Tennis Express or something like that. Had everything for sale, and so they were over there looking at rackets, and Granddad goes, Rebecca, would you like to have a new tennis racket? I couldn't afford the tennis racket, but Granddad could, you know. And then Re I guess Rebecca had learned from Hannah, you know, how to bat those eyes, you know. And so next thing you know, and... And, and every time, almost always, every time we go to see the grandparents, he's like, bring your rackets, I'm going to restring them, and I'm going to set the tension just right, because you're my favorite. Eli's ever done anything for you? I can't think of anything. Oh, yeah, he gave Eli a truck. And so the story goes. <laughs> Y'all look upon your children and your grandchildren with enormous love, don't you? And you love it when you see them living with wisdom and, and um, um, kindness in their lives. And you see them do something good for someone else. And your heart is moved, isn't it? And you want to do something for them. Right? Scripture talks about how God, he sees our righteousness. He sees us. It, you know, Noah, here's Noah. Noah's a righteous man. What did God do? He looked upon Noah with, help me church, he looked upon Noah with favor, and then God uses Noah to reclaim 
and renew and restart his agenda for creation. God looks upon Mary. I don't know what it is about Mary that God sees in her, but obviously she has a heart that's open and available for him. And she makes herself available, no matter what the cost. And by the way, it's hard for us to understand. She was betrothed or engaged to be married to Joseph. When you and I go through an engagement, that's in our, in our day and time, that's not a legal binding agreement. Do you still have an exit door? I, Carrie, I remember Minnie's uncle telling me specifically one hour before the wedding, he said, it's not too late. Oh, yes, it was. The dress had been bought. <laughs> Are y'all following me? Uh, everything had been said. Things had been made. It's not, so we understand, okay, obviously there's no legal binding agreement until the minister says, I pronounce you husband and wife by the authority of the state of Texas, and I always throw in the greater authority, Jesus Christ, I pronounce you husband and wife. You know, and then you get to the kissy-kissy stuff, and then life goes on. In their day and time, when someone was betrothed or engaged, that was a legal binding agreement. And so, this is a scandalous moment for Mary that she's risking in her life. And can you imagine Mary going, Look, I've not been with a man. And... Three months later, four months later, five months later, six months later. In those days and in that time, you, if you wanted to maintain your innocence, the people would probably take you to the gate of the city, and there they would put you on display and mock you in the position in life that you're taking. And according to Deuteronomy 22, you would likely be stoned to death. But you know what? I think Mary just understands the gravity of this moment. The greatness of God and his faithfulness to sustain her life. And she says, and I want to read again, Mary asked, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God. Now, one of the things that we don't want to miss in this text is the consent of Mary. It, it's not, look, you have to do this. You have no choice in the matter. Now, the word talks about you will. This will occur to you. But obviously, as you read the text, Mary still has a choice. The choice is not removed from her. She has to consent to this partnership with God in and through the Holy Spirit. And she declares in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. And so we see the beginning of the greatest event that has or ever occurred for mankind. It occurred because of the goodness of God. It occurred because God chose to move with his Holy Spirit. And it occurred among someone in an obscure place among obscure people, a very young woman pledged to be married. But what do we know about God? God looks at the heart, does he not? He looks at the heart with David. Some people see just a shepherd boy, maybe a little smelly. Could use a bath sometime real soon. Kind of ruddy looking. Handsome, but a little bit country, right? He's wearing overalls with one shoulder harness hanging off. God can't use someone like that. And Samuel says, oh, 
Man looks at the outward things. God looks at the heart. Here's Mary. We would never really recognize her as a tremendous servant of God. Now, I know she's exalted in some circles, even worshipped in some circles, you know, but I don't want to miss the point that she is blessed. For all generations, we'll call her blessed. You know, uh, she goes to Mary, or she goes to Elizabeth, verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready, hurried to a town in the hill country in Judea, and, and where she uh, entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise. And then Mary breaks out in song. You know what? In the first two chapters in the Gospel of Luke, there are four songs. There's Mary's song, the Magnificat, which we sang part of it a while ago. And then there's, there's a Zachariah song. It's, it's often referred to as Benedictus. And then there is the song of the angels, you know, the glow. I don't know if that's the tune that they sang it to, but Gloria in excels is Deo. There's that song. And then there's Simeon's song, uh, the old man that, uh, that saw Mary and Joseph at the temple. Songs are just bursting forth. This moment is deserving of the greatest glory that we as humans can ascribe. And so at, during this Christmas season, I want to challenge all of us to magnify and glorify God. Hey, sing it, speak it, live it, share it, reflect on it. Reflect on the fact that Mary said, let it be, or may it be, as you have said. The second thing I want us to think about during this holiday season is, am I a person favored by God? Am I someone favored by God? Am I someone that is that is humble and contrite in spirit? Am I someone that is striving to live a righteous and and faithful life to God. I know I'm not perfect, we say to ourselves. And it's true. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. And you are as well. But God is waiting and ready to act. His favor doesn't just end with Mary. His favor continues for all generations. Mary was just a part of getting this thing going. And you and I are now participants in it. Listen to what the angels say to the shepherds as they sing their song in chapter 214. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Listen, God's favor is still available today. God's favor is still available today. God wants to work through his favored people. Will you and I be open as Mary was? You know, I think about Mary. She had to carry Jesus for, uh, what, nine months? Probably. Something like that. Not long after that, they had to make a run down to Egypt to escape because their lives were in jeopardy. She came up, back up with Joseph. They tried to raise a son and a family to know the Lord. Obviously, they did a pretty good job at it. She watched Jesus grow. She watched Jesus begin his ministry. At one time, she thought Jesus was out of his mind. She really did. Mary doesn't have all of her perfections when it comes to her son. Mary got to experience the awfulness of the crucifixion and the burial of her oldest son. But Sunday came. And Jesus burst up from the grave, right? Think about what Mary went through in her life. All of the inconveniences, all of the question, maybe some potential gossip going around behind her head, 
all, and attention that she didn't necessarily want in her life. But look, she's a part of God's story, and God's story is the only story that matters. Amen? God's story is the only story that matters. Would you be inconvenienced by God? Could you be interrupted by God? Some of you have had someone come to you and said, hey, would you teach a Bible class on Sunday morning for our third or four, four year, five, five year olds? Would you do that? And you go, well, I don't know. I got to look in my calendar. I got to see if it kind of fits our schedule. We may be going on a couple of trips. I know I'm going to be out of town quite a bit, right? I don't know if I can be inconvenienced for 13 weeks teaching a little class of kids, right? But I do want God's favor. <laughs> Hey, would you be available to lead a small group Bible study for a quarter? Could you do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I've, my kids got some things going on, some activities. Man, Sunday evenings or whatever evening it is that y'all normally do life groups on, I just don't know. It's just like, I don't know if I could do that. I, I, you know, I just don't feel confident enough, you know. Well, I can provide for you some curriculum. I, I'll do some coaching. I'll give you some, I, John, I don't know. I just... I, you know, I'm just, I'm just not comfortable doing. Have you seen her house? Have you seen their houses? My house doesn't look like anything like their house. Why don't you ask them to host it at their house? Well, actually, I'm just asking you to host it at your apartment. We don't need a big lot of space. We just need room for a small group of people. Well, I don't know. Isn't it funny how we come up with all kinds of excuses in life of the inconveniences of God? But we miss out on God's favor, right, man? Mary's choice, let it be. May it be as you have said, has blessed people now for millennia. Could you bless people for a moment? May God bless us all as we ponder and think about the ongoing gift of his favor. If we can serve any of you this morning through prayer, we have this time of, as an invitation. You can come forward while we sing and express whatever is on your heart to the Lord. Uh, talk with me or one of the elders. As the church, we're going to pray for you. We're going to serve you. We're going to lead you to a closer relationship with the Lord. So we want to invite everyone to stand. Kai, if you would, come up and lead us in this song. If we can serve you, make your way forward as we stand and sing.